Cannabis News and Views, your bi-weekly program about the dynamic and challenging world of cannabis in California and beyond. I'm your host, Jude Tillman. From our studios in Mendocino County, we bring voices from all sectors of the cannabis industry and community, including cultural traditions, spirituality, the healing history of this remarkable herb. With Cannabis News and Views, you'll learn about the medicinal uses of cannabis, cultivation tips and targets, county, city, and state regulations, the war on drugs and prison rights, the spiritual meaning of cannabis, the inspirational role that cannabis has played in art and music through the decades, the up-and-coming world of tourism, and much, much more. Today, we're looking at the core of the cannabis industry, the, the roots, if you will, growing the plant. We'll talk about the fundamentals of cultivation, but we'll also explore some of the many methods and the philosophies of growing cannabis that have emerged, especially in the past five years as we've seen this new green rush sweeping over our state. And here to guide us in this overview are three leaders in cultivation here in Mendocino County. We welcome to my left, Devin Calloway, who's the founder and CEO of Eco Farm Holdings, a Mendocino County-based corporation engaged in sustainable cultivation practices. Devin has more than a decade of experience in the cannabis industry with a specialty focus on regenerative and vegan organic cultivation methods. For the past five years, he's been acquiring, developing, and farming cannabis properties here in Mendocino County. To his left is Gabriel Flores, the founder and CEO of Grow It Alls, a year-old startup created to give guidance to cannabis farmers on methods, nutrients, and various approaches to cultivation situations. Gabriel has 10 years of experience operating Mendocino County Hydro Garden, one of our local Fort Bragg success stories. He um, holds a degree in biology and human genetics from the University of California, San Diego. To his left is Garrett Lumley, the Chief Operating Officer of Grow It Alls. He holds a degree in Marketing and Finance from the University of the Pacific. Smile, Garrett. <laughs> yeah, you look like you're ready to go to sleep. Garrett's been in the industry for 20 years now, and he's survived as a cultivator in Mendocino County for at least 10 years. He is also, he is also serving as a consultant in the county and has for two years. Welcome, all of you, to Cannabis News and Views. Thank you. Thank you, dude. So, um, so much to talk about and so little time, but let's assume for a minute that I'm, you know, just came into this industry and I know nothing. <laughs> so we're going to start with a few basics, spend a little time on some basics, and then move on to some of your unique approaches to guiding people in the art and science of cultivation. First of all, let's get clear about what we're talking about when we say cultivation. In the last 10 years here in the Emerald Triangle, we've, um, em Emerald Triangle, home of arguably the best cannabis in the world, <laughs> if we do say so ourselves, but we've seen a huge increase statewide and actually nationwide in uh, indoor grows, uh, greenhouses, um, and, and in an attempt to create even more cannabis to capture that market share, we've seen more light depth, uh, this, uh, as one person said, that's just an attempt to fool the plant into thinking it's a different season. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, that I think that that person was being somewhat disparaging of it. But, you know, the, there's a dire need to get into the marketplace successfully. And so one crop a year isn't going to pull that off for a lot of people. So um, let's, I don't know if that's a fair representation, but tell me, what do we mean by cultivation these days? Devin? Well, um, in terms of the Mendocino County or cultivation, okay, cultivation in, yeah, in general, sure. yeah. Well, I mean, I think it applies. You know, there's there's many different types of cultivators. You know, there's your personal, um, you know, personal cultivator that has a closet grow or a couple plants in their backyard and is looking to produce for you know, their own consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you maybe have your cottage industry grower that. Um, you know, traditionally in Mendocino County is maybe cultivating 25 plants or so, and mm -hmm. um, it's able they're able to offset a little bit of their um, you know their their annual income um, by growing medicine, and um, and then you have your large scale commercial grower that is you know running a you know agricultural business. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and all those profiles have very different needs. You know. Uh, okay, so so that's helpful. That helps us hone it down. Let's stick to commercial. 
even within commercial, you're talking large scale, but commercial can be subdivided into small growers, medium sized growers, and large scale growers. Uh, that's the, what I've heard, the way I've heard it characterized. Gabe, what would you say as a cultivator in the commercial realm these days? Hoop houses? What's that? You know, whatever. I mean, it seems right. like there's so many. Ask ways. building and planning about that. Yeah, we'd like a definition <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, it's for us. You know, the idea of commercial growing is trying to move forward in this industry and be relevant. And I think that's a big, hot topic for people. It's yeah. like, how do I stay relevant moving forward in this industry? And with that, there's a lot of fear that's being promoted. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, how do I, it's like, I want to catch up. I want to be a part of this. I want to be something. Right. And you see people struggling with that. And one of our biggest mottos moving forward with anybody who wants to cultivate is, you cannot truly come to a good answer based off of fear. You have to move yourself away from fear and make these decisions based outside of that. Mm -hmm. When you come to a rational decision that is no longer guided by fear, you can then move forward and decide what type of cultivator you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we look at the opportunity that's being presented to us, and we truly believe in the idea of circling the wagons, mm -hmm. building a community of growers that support one another, help each other, diversify what they're doing, and make this something relevant for all of us. The idea of being a single cultivator in the oncoming storm, I don't see it. Yeah. I want to believe that we know what it means to stand together. You know, in the times when we were all behind the curtain of what was legal in this community, we stood together. Mm. If a brother told you to come down and help out, you came. Mm -hmm. You loaded up your truck. You did what needed to be done. This is no different. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, this community has roots. I've seen it from behind the counter. Mm -hmm. I've seen it time and time again where a parent was hiding what they were doing from their children and now can proudly say, this is what I did to help our family survive. Mm -hmm. And coming forward, I look forward to even more of those stories coming to light of how mm -hmm. generations of growers have force this industry into a better place and survive. Wow. Gabe, that was just an aspirational speech. I wish we'd ended the show on that. But Sorry. I have to say... No, <laughs> I get a little no, passionate sure. about it. No, <laughs> Sorry. I can tell, and I share that passion. It's just, it's so ideal, and uh, it's true in the underground. I know a lot of growers who came to each other's aid in times of trouble, and, you know, it's raining. Help me get my crop in. I'll help you get your crop in. It's old-time farming in, this, in the history of this country. That's true. But we're also coming out of four decades of prohibition mentality. So there is fear, and it's going to be a big deal to try to overcome that fear. Garrett, do you have something to add to what these two gentlemen have said? Um, when it comes to the fear that you're talking about, a yeah. lot of it too is most of these people, you know, they've, I mean, in Mendo County especially, you have people who for years have built their homes without permits. They're, they're not used to dealing with the county. They're not used to dealing with the bureaucracy. And so that's another, another thing that they're having to overcome yeah. is that, wait a second, now all of a sudden I have to ask permission to do all this stuff when before... I never did. Yeah. Or it's not that they didn't have to, it was just there was no there was no repercussions. And yeah. what they're seeing now is that okay, building and planning, Department of Ag, even mm -hmm. the executive uh, department here in the county, I mean, they're all they're in the same position as a lot of these growers. They're struggling to catch up with an industry that is growing exponentially. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's kind of a two-way street whereas as much as, you know, as cultivators and people in the industry, we want those people to give us, you know, a defined line. Okay, what what do we need to do? How do we need to do it? And let's so we can move forward. At the same time, we have to be a little more patient too and understand that bureaucracy takes time. Yeah. And yeah, it does. It's, but it's we difficult. also need to come out of our cocoons. I mean, people moved into the Emerald Triangle to grow cannabis back in the day when you want. They wanted to get away from government True. and away from all of that and just go up in the hills and grow their crops and sell it. That's and so for people to then step forward. When 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 I, for instance, sent out an email saying show up at the board of supervisors, and we know we've got thousands of thousands of growers here in in the county, and five, ten people show up. You know, it's sort of like it's hard to get people to get be civically engaged with these. With the with the county, with this with whoever the planning and building. We're in a policy discussion, not a cultivation discussion. Right. I gotta psh, stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes back so, to the fear question. Is yeah. the fact that it's for years nobody wanted to stick their head above the fence. Right. And so now, when you're asking people to do that, yeah. When the county, for example, during those first meetings, you had a lot of people in the coastal 
community here that were sticking their head above the fence, and then they kind of come and says, oh, wait a minute, if you're in the Coastal Commission, we can't do anything. Right. And you were part of the 9-3 rolling program last year, but now you're not allowed to be. Yeah. So those people now, I mean, they've just had the rug yanked out from under them, which right. would cause other people within the county to possibly look at this as, wait a minute, okay, maybe I, I, maybe I should bide my time, wait until all this stuff is hashed out. Well, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, I think, I mean, a lot of people, like you said, did come up here to, so they didn't have to pay taxes, they didn't have to get building permits, and didn't have the normal responsibilities of running a business. You know, and we're in this transition p period right now where this is, this is a business and this has to be looked at one. You have to, you know, look at your cost. You know, you have to look at what the, um, the timing of the year in which you're, um, you're bringing your crop to market, what strains you're growing, um, your labor force. And or if these aren't looked at at a bit in a business uh, perspective and an actual plan is put in place, it's going to be very difficult to survive because yeah. the price isn't going up. You know, it's it's going down, but the cost to produce cost to produce with all the regulatory fees is increasing. Right. So, you know, you really have to start looking how how can how can we start bringing our costs down? How can we become more efficient? Uh, maybe the old maybe the old way of doing things isn't the best way to do it now because this the margins aren't as high. Well, there's there's a tension there because on the one hand, the market is going to demand that people do just what you say. And when I'd like to hear what all of you have to say about when somebody comes to you and says, I'd like to enter the marketplace. I haven't been commercial before other than maybe black market and I've stayed alive and I've made some money off of that. But now I really want to enter the marketplace. Well, how is that going to make a difference in what dirt I use and what nutrients I, I use and what strains I pick? All of that kind of, how do they, how do they choose make those decisions now that they want to be a part of the commercial marketplace. I think a lot of what you're saying is true, and we're going to get to this issue a little bit later, but there's a lot of bling out there that can turn people's heads, you know? Anybody who doesn't have experience at coming out of the hills and becoming part of the commercial world... Yeah, you see these, these cartoons, promises. you see sexy women, and it's, like, yeah. and it's traditionally you know, catered towards men that are growing you know, a high-value cash crop. But you, when you go into stores now, that doesn't. it's not a selling point. It's like... Where, what's going to get you the most bang for your buck? What's going to be that's what's the most sustainable? You right. know, and before it didn't matter. You can go buy you know these expensive products, and you know they may juice your plants up, and you know. But now it's like that may not be the economical you know, solution. Be the key. All right, let's come back around to this philosophical discussion. This is all great stuff. I love it. We're gonna come back around, but let me just back up a little bit. We got the basics that people have to look at. You know, it's sort of it's your dirt, it's your location. Altitude, latitude, where are you? Are you inland? Are you on the coast? Nutrients, supplements, pruning, handling the plant, pest control, light, air, water. What's changed in the last five years and what kind of advice do you give people who come to you and say, what do I do if I've been just doing an old fashioned, small time grow and now I wanna get into the commercial market? What do I change? What do I look at? What's the first thing I should look at? What's the most important thing? My dirt, my nutrients? Where I'm located, what's the most important thing I should look at, Gabe? Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a very complicated question, and okay. I think a lot of some of the old time practices mm -hmm. were definitely not good practices. I mean, they did them because it was something that was going to go to market, make money regardless. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this, the funny little games we like to play are like, you know, when you entered the market, how much was your first? Pound. I was like, yeah, what you could sell outdoor for four or five thousand dollars six, seven years ago. Right? You know? you can tell, <laughs> exactly. You can tell somebody when they got into this game yeah. by how much they received off their first, you know, yeah. their first paycheck. Yeah. And it's hilarious to me. And I, and I and I laugh about it because you know that leaves this huge room for error. Yeah. Like you could get away with a lot when your profit margin was five thousand <laughs> percent of what your input was. Mm. But that led to a lot of bad habits. A lot of people, and it, we had the very, you know, we're very fortunate to have traveled to a regulated state and, and worked there and seen some of the most stringent testing policies in the country. Mm. You know, the OLCC in Oregon mm -hmm. tests at parts per trillion. Mm. That means that three generations of cuttings. Explain will, that, tests at parts per trillion. Uh, parts per trillion, what? basically. Pesticides? Pesticides, anything. Anything. Um, basically, if you had dipped a plant in something that is systemic, just, that means... It grows it, inside the plant. Right. Mm -hmm. So it genetically latches itself to that plant. Mm -hmm. When it's grown, cut, grown again, cut, grown again, and then taken a sample of, 
that parts per trillion test will show, mm -hmm. and those plants will fail. Depending on the growing conditions, depending on how long the lifespan sure. of that of the mother plant was. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and typically in indoor, yes, it's a three generation. Three or, generations yeah, or, indoor. Or, how many or, generations outdoor? Well, it, it varies also depending on the pesticide that's used. Different pesticides have different half life. Yeah, uh -huh. and that's what you look for is the the radioact the the basically the half life of that can be altered due to UV situations. Right. Um, so an outdoor plant will actually assimilate and produce less generations of time for it to actually work its way out. But, you know... But back uh, to your larger point. I mean, larger moving from the old style practices... And moving into the new, yeah. it's like you want to basically start... I always say, know where your genetics are coming from. Mm. It's good to know that you have a clean, reputable source because if you fail from there, these testing situations are not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the practices have led to bad genetic stock being put out there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions and not enough answers as to, you know, are some of the soils that are being used being treated? Is there drift? Is there all of these situations that are causing these plants to, to show up? What is drift? Uh, drift would be basically spraying from one yard and then drifting into, you know, like an intake. Oh, it's, hap it's, it's happening with vineyard. Right? Uh, right. farms that are located close proximity to vineyards, oh. you know, where they're using, uh, you know, pesticides that are banned for can that won't pass testing and just a simple, you know, shift in wind can contaminate your entire crop. Don't uh, vineyards get tested? they uh, different levels. Different levels of, and they yeah. can, yeah. And different requirements. <laughs> different requirements. More lax or more oh, stringent? More much lax. more lax. Much more much lax. They have a little Gee, bit more money in the be? game. <laughs> <laughs> We're just That's a, <laughs> pretty pretty soon. Maybe the the tides will change. You uh -huh. know, I mean, I mean it's know. happened in Salinas Valley right now, where um, you know the soil is so contaminated, and there's so much spraying going on in that valley that all this influx of these large cannabis operations and greenhouses that didn't have um, proper you know filtered intake, they were t intaking you know s r s uh, drift as he said from neighboring farms, and hmm. thousands of pounds were contaminated. They could not sell. And what. It they just had to dump them? <laughs> well, you can, there's way, if they're going to extract, I mean, depending on their output, they, there's like, ways to, you know, potentially filter out some certain types of mm, pesticides. But, right. but you were saying? Oh, no, no, he's, he's absolutely correct. You know, okay. with, the, with fractal distillate and some mm -hmm. of the processes that are coming, you know, into Filtration the Filtration techniques. Yeah, and, you, can, you can spin out a lot of the impurities uh -huh. in the plant. Um, huh. Returns may not be necessarily as... Fruitful, but that's cost effective. But. Right. So it sounds to me like the, sh the switch from old style black market growing to entering the legal commercial market is largely a, the, the, the upshot is your costs of production are going to increase vastly and your return is going to decrease vastly. This is what I've got so far. Well, no, no, this. no. I mean, it's you think about cost of produce increasing. Right. Oh. And that's what we can talk about now. Where yeah. right, you know, where the, that's that's. The I mean, that, part. that's the thing. You know, it's like understanding P and Ls and input costs and taking averages and seeing what outputs yeah. are. I mean, we as a culture have lived on a very high level of mean. Mm -hmm. You know, now when things get tight, I mean, the realistic output for you know, what you're producing is is good still, even mm -hmm. if you were to output at, say, $800 mm -hmm. a, a pound, mm -hmm. you know? The profit margins are still, still there. very, you know, better than you can grow any other agricultural crop I mean, at this point in time. If you Get look it? at corn, corn's like, I think it's, uh, it's negative $175 per bushel. What does that mean? So negative. Mean, You're losing one seventy five. Per bushel of corn in production, it's around one hundred seventy. You lose about one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. But with subsidies, that all gets made up. Oh. So I mean, it's it's one of. I mean, that's just kind of. But there's no subsidizing in cannabis. No, probably not. You know? So I mean, <laughs> not it's, so much. it's you know, and, and that's that statistic is it's like three or four years old. But still, it's when you look at that compared to what what kind of a crop you know the profit margins in, in this business. It's still there. It's just people are not going to get, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred percent, four hundred percent profit. Well, you, you know, when start... you read when you read through a magazine like uh, Marijuana Business Magazine, um, and and you, the the, the um, um, articles about cultivation, they 
the recurring theme of the people being interviewed is how to keep production costs down. You know, get these fancy trim machines or, you know, get these fancy lights or circulate your air better in your room so that you, uh, if one of your uh, air conditioners go out, you know, everything's covered and you can, and it's cheaper to do it this way and this way and this way. I mean, there just seems like that's, so you don't think production costs are going well, up? I, well, and regulatory wise they are, but, you know, one of the things that can be a, a large reoccurring cost is the constant repurchasing of soil. Um, as well as bottled products, you know, uh, and um, so indoor costs it, no, could be going up. No, 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 no. no. But not. light depth farmers are buying new soil. A lot of light depth farmers mm -hmm. are buying soil every run. They're using bottled products, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the one of the parts of you know one of the things we started looking at was like I got tired of buying bag soil, and you know, that was far inferior than what I could make on my own. So you know, like some of the major brands out there, you could pay two fifty, three hundred dollars a yard for soil right now. You know, I was so, so I was like, well, that's a huge cost, you know, especially yeah. every run. How can I design my own soil from scratch? And, um, you know, instead of having to create, you know, add new soil every time, how can I re what can I do to reamend that soil and bring my cost down? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so and that's one of the things that we found was as a bait was, a, you know, a way to save a, a, a large amount of money I annually was you know, designing soil from scratch, where I could make soil for less than $100 a yard that was far, you know, a premium soil that you couldn't buy anywhere else mm -hmm. you know, versus $300 a yard, and then re-amending that every run. So we brought, we were able to bring our costs from, say our initial cost per gram was five cents for, uh, per gram of soil cost. So that's, you know, say on 2,000 square feet, it's about 2,500 to $3,000 for 25 yards of soil you know, initial one-time cost. Mm -hmm. Then the next round, you know, instead of having to buy, to, to put $3,000 out again, we re-amend at about a, uh, one cents per gram. But isn't, aren't your labor costs higher if you're re-amending your own soil? No, well, th you have other costs that are associated with um, buying new soil every run. You have transportation costs, you have more labor costs, because, you know, those, those bags have, they don't just magically appear in pots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. And then you have the environmental impact, transportation, you know, it's yeah. the disposal of the soil. Uh -huh. um, you know, and these are variables that, you know, you have to start adding up financially. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Soil. Let's stick with soil for a second because we're moving into unique approaches, which is the second part of the discussion today, uh, which is great because I want to hear uh, what your approaches to this are too. So we can stick with soil because the other thing that I read a lot about is if you, you can reduce your labor costs, if you automate, automate everything, put it all on computers, put it all, make it all you know, electronic, digital, this, that, and the other thing. So let's go to that then uh, as well. But do you have anything to add in, in terms of the soil question? On the soil side, Devin makes a good point. There's, you know, there's all these uh, costs associated with, you know, the one-time use or even two-time uses of soil. Um, but it's, again, like whether you're doing one-time use or you're recycling your soil and re-amending it, mm -hmm. you know, you still have to, if you are growing in pots, you still have to empty those pots, re-amend your soil, put it back in those pots. Or even if you're not, you have to re-amend it. In the, so the labor costs, like there are mm -hmm. costs that are, that a farmer is going to look at. And again, depending on how much they are personally engaged or whether they are hiring, you know, all of this labor out. I mean, that's a huge difference when you, in, when you look at, you know, that farmer's time, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of times what people will do is they'll look at it and go, oh, well, I, I'm not paying for any of this labor now, so I'm saving money. And that's true. But at the same time, it's, you're the labor force. What are you paying yourself? Yeah. Like what? Where, where? What's the value of your time? And that needs to be added in. It's just an opportunity cost. And it's again over time. Like one time, if you have a farmer coming into it, mm -hmm. okay, amending that soil, developing that soil, making all that soil. That's that's going to be huge upfront cost. Yeah. Which yeah. is why a lot of beginning farmers do just buy. They they're like, oh well, I can just go buy this potted soil and I can get started and then work my way up from there. Um. Again, it, it's. Those are the barriers we're looking at: initial upfront costs versus long-term costs. And yes, when you're looking at this as a business, your long-term profitability is what you really want to keep in mind. But if you don't have the time, the money, or the labor to be able to, say, start from scratch mm -hmm. and start amending your soil, and again, when you're trying to develop a product mm -hmm. that's clean, that passes all tests, and that you can sell on, on the market. 
sometimes it's that you don't have time to build up from that point. So it's, it's not easy yeah. building soil. Exactly. It's like, like yeah. you know, the first year that you run into deficiencies, you're doing testing, you're, you know, you may have to make certain modifications. It may be hot, you know, there's... It, but it's, you probably learn and get but, better oh, at yeah. it, right? <laughs> it's, a huge, it's, 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 a, it's a great, it's probably one of the best tools in learning to garden is, is basically, it's trial and error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know. And, and that's, that's, a, that's one of the things is it's when you're looking at this as a business, someone coming in, who has never done this commercially or who wants to do this commercially, that trial and error, especially when the costs of doing business are going up so greatly, you know, we don't we don't have the room for that, you know, to to lose an entire full term crop. Or you sure. know, if someone does that, when you look at sixty so sixty, seventy thousand dollars, right now our largest uh, our largest permit's ten thousand square feet, right? Yeah, yeah. Minimally. I would say minimally if you're starting from scratch. Um, you're probably going to look at somewhere with all of the regulations, getting your permitting and everything, minimally around fifty to sixty thousand dollars in input to start, and that's if <laughs> you don't have any. Going. That's if you don't have anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's a. I mean, that's still, and I think I'm probably being really conservative on that number. If you have yeah, nothing, yeah. and a large yeah. bulk of that is you're going to be your soil costs. You know, for like a ten thousand square feet, if you're doing full ten thousand square feet, you can be you're at a minimum of a hundred yards. Um, you know, maybe more than that, 150 yards of, of soil, you know, times what, 200, 300 dollars, depending on where, what type of soil you're buying. Right. You know, so it's. Right. This is this is all interesting. I was going to talk about. I think soil is really the heart of it. I was going to ask you about water and you know how do you how do you deal with pH in a in a healthy and safe way and lots of you know some of the other aspects. But um, I mean, I think soil is really the big deal. Let me, let me in, instead encapsulate the questions about uh, uh, water and about mechanization, for that matter, in this quote uh, from um, John Anderley. He has a, an indoor grow in Denver. He's quoted in this uh, cultivation special issue of uh, uh, Marijuana Business Magazine. He says, quote, there isn't a retail store in Colorado that will pay $1 more not one dollar more for completely clean, meaning no treatments of any kind in the flower stage, including organic treatments. So why would you do that? So what are your thoughts about the market, what's driving the market and what people, what, will, what they'll buy from you versus what you want to do to create a good crop? Gabe. They're, you know, the apples and oranges. Right oh. now, Colorado is testing at parts per million. million. So, million. Yeah, they're on the low end scale yeah. of the testing spectrum. Hmm. You know, OLCC parts per trillion. You know, we're really we encourage our farmers to understand that that's going to be the standard for California. California has never set up a regulation where they have not been the most stringent agriculturally in the entire U.S. So in California, it's going to be parts per billion. But no. parts per trillion. Right now, it's really trillion. parts per billion. It's set for but parts it's eventually. Per but I mean, certain distributors won't take. Well, are on the parts per trillion mile. So mm -hmm. if you're not, if you're parts per trillion, if you're under that, then they're not going to accept your product. You're not mm -hmm. going to be able to bring it and to the our distributors. Certain, for our audience's information, they're the ones that are going to be taking your crop and moving it to the laboratory, moving it to the retailer. They're the ones that are going to be uh, the sort of the pivot point for all of this. And the consumer um, base is also greatly different, hugely different. I mean, the cannabis culture from Colorado to California could not be more different. Explain that. Uh, I think that California has grown up in this culture, Northern California especially. We create, California created the culture, you know, and it's the largest producer, grows all the cannabis for the country. Yeah, yeah. And we, I mean, in this it, small area. Yeah, in this yeah. Emerald Triangle. Yeah, yeah. Was it yeah. 60%, I believe they said? That yeah. That's what I've heard. Sixty percent of, yeah. of all of the cannabis. However, in the States. most of the genetics that you know are popularized genetics have come from this area. You know, and well, there's no doubt that we've got a corner on the sort of the the cultivation the traditions. Canada, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and, Canada and New York job. too. You know, yeah. and family. <laughs> Much true, love to the, 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 the brothers up north. Uh, what I've heard, right? Exactly. And oh, yeah. to go. But um, the last eight months, ten months that I've I've been hearing more people come into our dispensary, Dragonfly, and um, and just growers I know. Um, um, we're saying um, my market from last year is gone because of the Oregon flood. The glut of product True. from Oregon is robbing us of that position that California has had vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. But yeah, on the black market. 
um, that's you know that organs producing lower black well, market prices. Well, you know, prices. let's be real. The black market still dominates. Look at how many. Yeah. We're supposed to have nine thousand uh, cultivators in Mendocino County, and how many have applied for a permit well, so far? Seven hundred something. Something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, yeah. So when you talk about the organ phenomenon, um, that's what people aren't realizing is a lot of that is coming from what are considered licensed permitted farms in Oregon, and they're right. not passing test. So they're in turn having to dump their product on the black market. They have another option. They're they don't have an option right. now. I mean, and I can't sit there and say, oh, it's this farm or that farm. But the yeah. amount of cannabis that is now being grown in Oregon versus, say, four years ago, yeah. under the permitted model, I mean, there's, it, it's just the, the, the amount that's coming down. They are. They're just like, look, we don't care about this crop. All we care about is that it's gone. Right. Because we can't sell it under our legal markets. We need to keep moving forward. So let's dump that, recoup at least our operating costs and move on. It's right. happening, it ca happens in California too. Exactly. I mean, even just in this area that we're in right now, the coastal region or, you know, from here to Ukiah, it's, we're in a fog zone, there's higher humidities. The m farmers aren't passing microbial tests. They're mm. completely failing microbial. And it's just, they're not like they're spraying pesticides. There's, there's no PM, botrytis, but there's, you know, maybe minute amounts of yeast and, oh you know, pollen or just natural occurring bacteria that is in the, you know, the, that particular microclimate. It's called mm. a plate test. I'm a sorry? Plate test. When you see your lab results, it'll show up as plate. And it's actually a combination of, like you said, yeast, bacteria, molds, um, and uh, pollen. So acceptable thresholds. Okay. But speaking to that also, it's like when you look at some of the, you know, some of the products that are coming out to treat a lot of the stuff that in the past has been you know, hard for farmers to deal with, powdery mildew, botrytis, um, you know, spider mites, any, a lot of the insects. If you look at them, some of these products are yeast-based. Yeah. yeah hmm. You know, I mean, and, and they're amazingly effective products, mm -hmm. you know, when they're used appropriately and regularly, but now you have a test, so that's not differentiating. For example, in Oregon, they actually differentiate anaerobic versus aerobic. Mm -hmm. And yeast being an aerobic, uh, aerobic bacteria, it's differentiated out on the positive side. That's interesting. They differentiate uh, types of yeast, and yet they have such a low threshold for uh, pesticides and other things that they're measuring. Yeah. The parts per million thing. And what is that about? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Listen, if you've just joined us, let's do an ID. You're uh, you're watching Cannabis News and Views, and today today our subject is cultivation, but it's really getting much broader than that because I don't think we can decontextualize cultivation from the economics and what's going on all around us in Oregon and in other states, and certainly what we're what we're going to be facing in 2018. This is a big transition period, and I don't think any I think people are delusional if they think we're going to move from so many decades of prohibition in into a regulated and free marketplace without a lot of hiccups and a lot of people being hurt, frankly, on, in the, uh, on the journey there. Um, on the program with us today, we have Devin Calloway, who is founder and CEO of EcoFarm Holdings, a Mendocino County-based corporation engaged in sustainable cultivation practices. And we're going to start to get into the nuances of how you each approach this. You're advising people. And then Gabriel Flores is the founder and CEO of Grow It Alls. That's a very cute name. Grow, <laughs> Grow It Alls, a, a year-old startup created to give guidance to cannabis farmers on methods, nutrients, and various approaches. But he and his colleague Garrett Lumley, who's the COO of Grow It Alls, have not have had more than one year experience uh, in the cannabis <laughs> business. Uh, we're talking decades here. So these are three highly seasoned cultivators sitting in the room with us today. And we're just dabbling really in this very deep and complex subject. But I think we're getting some really good information out. And I, I truly appreciate the, the trend of the conversation. So um, moving along to what you each uniquely bring to your own cultivation and how you advise other people. Earlier when we were talking, uh, Gabe, you you, um, you mentioned that Grow It All, so your company doesn't advocate any one way of growing, but you try to be open to all approaches and help people based on what their individual needs are. Could you just draw that out a little bit? What explicitly does that mean? I, I, you know, this is a very, it's, it's a lot of just residual learning from this industry, you know, moving up here and learning from not knowing anything at all mm -hmm. and trying to help people uh, understand growing techniques and things of that nature. Uh, we always come to this understanding that every grow situation is unique. Every mm -hmm. room is different. No matter how you try and replicate it space to space to space, the space itself sometimes dictates how the grow has to adapt. 
Every person who cultivates is different. How they approach problems, how they handle their plants, how they walk through and see things. Mm -hmm. It's very different from person to person to person. So to try and pigeonhole somebody into your idea is like trying to tell nature that they it must do what you tell it to. Give, it, give me an example uh, of, uh, say, sort of two extreme examples of, of people that are really different in their approach to cultivation. In, oh, I mean, there's if you could. numerous. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, when we talk about sustainability and reusing and, and keeping uh, the costs of the medium down, um, mm -hmm. there are people who utilize cocoa. Mm. in a situation where they can use cocoa for up to five years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in that instance, it's a drained away situation. You know, do I think that everybody should step into that immediately just to save money off of the <coughs> medium? Um, I don't. I think that people who, how they, how they come to this industry, what their space is like, what they're trying to, you know, do in the end mm -hmm. um, dictates what the grow is. You know, mm -hmm. and that's that's really how it goes. I mean, if you're going to go full term and produce specifically for oils and extracts and edibles, you can go full term, giant, massive plants and produce on a level that's, you know, very unlike people who would do DEP, who are trying to get, you know, percentage of their plant actual flower to market on shelf. Mm -hmm. You know, now we look at this model where there is differentiation between the top portion of the plant, middle portion of the plant, bottom portion of the plant, all the trimming, <laughs> leaf, stalk, everything. All has value now. Yeah. That's getting very nuanced. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really different than in the old days. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at this model and people are like, well, this is what I get for a pound. It's like, okay, well, how much did you get for your extract? Or your how smalls much? or and your, your smalls. trim. So <laughs> that, let's add all that back in. Now, where right. is your, you know, where's your margin at truly now? Where is um, it average out and... So cultivation techniques are, are unique, you know, uh -huh. just like every person is unique. I don't approach a garden like I approach, you know, uh, just a, a, a stencil. It's not a stencil for me. Uh -huh. I, I see people who have, you know, disabilities mm. who are in wheelchairs who can't do some of the things that I would expect a normal gardener to do. Mm -hmm. You know, not that they, they can't. It's just we have to attack it differently. You have to adapt. Yeah, and situation. so, you yeah. know, we create smaller beds or we do smaller aisles or we do smaller nettings, we do opener, you know, wider yeah. mm -hmm. things. It's all very unique. And then yeah. to say any one technique is is wrong is, is to not truly understand what gardening is. Sure. I think as a gardener and as a farmer, like we all understand, the land tells you what it needs. The plant, right. you always hear, and it's, I thought it was such a cliche when I was first working. The plant tells you what it needs. You know, and if but you it can, does. And when we, you know, like when we talk about automation, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, you can have a thousand cameras set up. Nothing is going to tell you better than the human eye. You need to know the language of the plant and speak yeah. the language of the plant. And right. that's where, the, you know, the whole automation thing is very difficult. And spreadsheet farming, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it opens yourself up to a lot of potential problems if you just base everything off automation and spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This plant in particular, it doesn't really lend itself to... And what we're trying to get out of it doesn't lend itself to the large-scale commercial grid farming that is, is fully automated. I mean, I have uncles in North Dakota that they literally program GPS into their tractors and they go back and sit in their truck on the side and the tractor just does a grid. Whoa. <laughs> and, you couldn't do that with cannabis. And you can't do that with cannabis. And, I mean, can we get one of those? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't. I mean, one of those right Checking away. yours. So, so, um, but at the same time, I mean, it's you, you're just not going to find the quality there. And they're finding that, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're growing hemp, it's a different ballgame, you know. And, yeah, yeah. and that's the other thing is there's so many different varieties of, of, of the plant that are out there. You know, from variety to variety, you also have a, almost a different language. You know? Well, let, let me ask you this, uh, since you brought up hemp, and uh, this, all of what you're saying transfers to my world, which is about medical cannabis. So when, when I am advising patients about, say, high CBD tinctures, I explain, this is not the pharmaceutical model where you take synthetic chemicals and you have precise doses of, or precise percentages of chemicals on a Petri dish. This is a plant. So you look at our bottles of the, the tincture that I recommend for high CBD, it says over 20 to 1. I'm not going to say it's 22 to 1 or 25 to one, it's agriculture. This is herbal medicine. And, and not only that, but it's going to have a different effect on every single person because it's individuated. You, you, it's going to respond. Your body, your body, your body. We all respond differently. So you can't cookie cutter 
uh, medicine, cannabis medicine, the way, and you can't do that with, I think, with even bud on the shelf, frankly. So people come into our dispensary and they say, well, what's your highest THC? And I say, it depends hmm. on your metabolism. And they hate it that we won't play the numbers game. No, we don't right. play the numbers game, you know? Well, an interesting part of that is when you talk about different varietals. Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen it where people that are, you know, they only they only smoke sour diesel. They only smoke OG because that's the strongest stuff they can get. Mm -hmm. And then you turn around and you give them something like, you know, pineapple or a sour tangy or something else that's got a lower THC content and they're a couch potato for the next two days. <laughs> right. And it's two different varieties, two different plants, two different... Terpene make levels of mercy yeah. in it. All yeah, of it's got yeah. it's got huge a hugely different profile. So then it it's going to affect the like when you accustom the body to one thing, mm -hmm. even if it is a similar plant, it's going to be you're going to have a different reaction. I mean, I have an allergy where literally like to the only apples I can eat are Fuji apples. Yeah, they make my but in our body responds. We build up a tolerance too. But I wanted to ask you about hemp because what's important to me about this and to a lot of people is this question of drift which I just now learned this word. Uh, so um, we don't, hemp is not medicine. Hemp has got a bad cannabinoid profile. It doesn't have the full whole plant, uh, flavonoids, terpenes, everything else that you need in the medicine to be effective in healing. So what do you do when people want to grow industrial hemp in the Emerald Triangle and we've got drift problems? It won't happen. It it's won't not, happen? It's not, it, the, the real estate is too expensive and we don't have enough uh, agricultural acreage to effectively produce, you know, uh, large quantities of hemp. It'll go agree? to the Central Valley. In the Emerald Triangle, I think I think he's got a good point. When you get over into Sacramento Valley and Central Valley, um, Southern San Joaquin Valley, I mean, mm. there's the thing is, is you're gonna have, I mean, that amount of pollen. I mean, yeah. that's 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 more of, of what I see being an issue is is if yep. you, you're gonna have people like I mean, you've got Calaveras, you've got even though Nevada County's laws are pretty restrictive. Uh, Yuba, um, the Yuba area, which Yuba, yeah, Yuba. Uh, they're all they're all growing massive amounts of cannabis, mm -hmm. and yeah, what's acres of whole plant, yeah, whole yeah. plant. Oh yeah, whole acre plant. acres of outdoor acres of greenhouse. There's yeah. major production going on in mm -hmm. those areas right now, and as Gary was saying, it's like the the cross pollination issues down the road. They're all going to get cross pollin pollinated. Their, their plants are going to hermy. Um, they're not going to be able to sell those flowers on the shelves. You know, maybe to extract. Hermy, hermaphrodite. Well, I mean, that's. Yeah. I would actually. You're probably going to have less of that, but you're definitely going to have a degradation of product. The, hermit, the hermaphrodation usually comes is from a basically a rebreeding back into the same genetics. You can breed it out, mm -hmm. but generally, when you take one genetic and you breed it back into each other, you're basically allowing a outlier gene to reproduce itself and. He's probably the one being the genetics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we're good. But, but yeah. uh, Emerald Triangle, uh, if, you know, we're very lucky that we're probably protected from that pollen drift. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're so far north. Winds. And we have those north winds. Yeah. Uh, if we can protect ourselves. It's, it's yeah. true. So for, for people who are trying to uh, step up into the commercial world or get started for starters, uh, would you recommend to them that they... Um, I want to ask two questions in one. Um, what do you think about monocultures? Monocult and then also, uh, would you recommend that they stick to just a few strains or do multiple strains, hedge their bets? What's your recommendation? Keep it simple. Yeah, kiss it's, it. Yeah, yeah, that's the best way to simple's, keep it simple, stupid. Simple's good, for sure. And, you know, it depends. You know, again, it's a, it's a, it's, that's a, a, a question that, you know, if you're growing too many variables, 5,000 square feet, 2,500 square feet, 10,000 square feet, mm. You know, that, that answer very much changes. You know, if you're on 2,500 square feet, grow one plant. Well, let's say it's 10,000 because we're in Mendocino. If you're doing 10,000, I like to look at a model where you're going to grow 80% of what the market value is, mm -hmm. and then you can experiment with the rest. So, okay. I, so they say you're growing 80% OGs or a high, you know, high demand uh, genetic that you know, the other 20% you can put in your flavors or your exotics and... You know, see what the market or go demands. ten ten and donate ten percent to just CBD research. Yeah, which would be right awesome. A and to your <laughs> local dispensaries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if yeah. we can, if we can get people to the idea that you know, I mean, this is where the the, the change in medicine, and especially I'm sure you know you understand this, with technology and the way that things are coming out, um, we're seeing more and more the ability to precisely extract from the plant what patients might need. Mm. Um, you see high CBD strains being bred specifically for the research mm -hmm. and the possibilities that are coming forward. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing also as well is like 
byproducts from some of this distillate, um, such as the clear, mm -hmm. which have uh, reactants to actual the, the nerve endings mm -hmm. and can, can numb out, you know, affected areas like maybe burn patients. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's exactly. just so much possibility. There's also, you know, there needs to be a little bit of trepidation with it as well. Yeah. You know, when we start getting into the realm of this is medicine, you know, there needs to be an understanding that at some point when this becomes federally legal, you know, these things will be classified differently. For well, sure. we, we've got a big, a big chasm between where the most advanced research on uh, cannabis medicine is and right. where the cultivators and the medicine makers are that operationalizing what we already know theoretically. We already know there are more receptors in the body than we first thought. There's more than CB1s and CB2s. We know a lot of stuff that we can't begin to translate into operationalizing. But but the other problem, uh, I mean, when you're, well, I'm going to, we're going to drift over into <laughs> the question of the economics and, the, and the, what the market will bear and what investors will tolerate, what lenders will give you money for, what partners want. Because when you're a cultivator, and let's say you want to just grow CBD because you're really devoted passionately, your mother had cancer, or whatever reason, you're really devoted to medicine, but that's not an economically viable thing to do right now. How do you, how do you advise, how do you advise people? Well, I think you have to look at the consumer market as well and what the consumer is demanding. Um, you know, it goes back to your question, you know, question before about, or we are referenced to Colorado saying that dispensaries won't pay more than a dollar more for, you know, clean, organic, you know, flour. Mm -hmm. But I think the consumer is becoming more educated and the consumer is demanding more um, quality standards and a certain, certain types of, you know, genetics and certain production, you know, cultivation methods. And, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they're just as the craft, you know, like we were saying before, craft, craft beers, you know, look how long it took for the whole, you know, craft brewery market to ca catch up and compete with the mainstream Budweiser's and the, you know, the Coors and everybody. And it's yeah, you're, but I'm going to beat my drum here because out of the 20 licenses we have in the state, you see any license for or any resources right. put toward consumer education, toward patient education. So I have a patient who came in from Nevada and he comes into Dragonfly and he says, for, for years I've been, I've got bad neuropathies and I've been buying my tinctures at this local dispensary. July 1st, Requin right, yeah. in Nevada. He goes back to his dispensary and there are now two lines, one at one end of the counter for rec, one at the end of the, end of the counter for medicine. The end of the counter for rec goes down around the door, down the hallway and out and around the street. There were two people in line on the medicinal side. He goes up to the medicinal side, he says, I'd like to get my tincture, and they said, well, we don't really have shelf space anymore for that because look at where the money is. So, you know, you, it's not just a question of rely on the consumers, because the consumers, they're, they're victims of the market-driven yeah. laws as well. How do we help shape this? That's but my it, concern. It's happening with organic foods, though, right now. You know, you have, you know, I was just listening to a podcast where they were, they were talking about, um, you know, there was just one of the conferences, at conference in Salinas, and that all the big box buyers, you know, the Costco's, the Safeways, they're all, 80% of their consumers are now demanding organic, organic. produce. Yeah, you're right. You know, it took so a now while for that market to All the develop, farmers though. have yeah. to start, you know, changing their methods, no, and a lot right. of them can't. You're right. You're um, right. But that's like, that's the mainstream consciousness is shifting, and, you know, we're being held to higher, you know, accountability mm -hmm. in terms of producers now. and. Mm -hmm. That's okay. where we, you know, we can go back into methods and what, you know, differentiators in, in the marketplace and what, what it means to grow organically versus conventionally and what type of flavor profile, what type of, you know, potency Two and efficiency. Reject, and so, okay, so let's back into, let's, let's we, we're, we're in reverse engineering here. Um, back into cultivation. How does this... How do grow it alls take this what what Devin's just said it, uh, into account? And when you're advising cultivators, in in terms of do you give them any advice about shaping the market uh, for toward organic or toward medicine or toward? You know, it would highly depend on. I mean, if, if we're talking about someone who's just coming into the into the into the business or mm -hmm. into the commercial side of the business, um, it's. It comes down to is is what it, even even if you have an ideal that you want to strive to, um, Devin's made a really good point that you have to look at what the market will bear, and if as much as you may want to be a hundred percent organic right now, your pocketbook may not allow for it, and the end consumer, I mean, really prices for the end consumer haven't changed. If you look at what, what's what is what their expenses are still selling yeah, for the same price. exactly they're not selling for any different price. Well, it's not going in our pockets, believe me. No, right. I've had to. No, I, I know. know. I've had to raise prices because of all the taxes. Right. You know? No, I, I, and, no. And, and that's it's the incredible. Thing. 
Um, I mean, when you're taxed at, a, I mean, on the federal level, close to a 73% tax rate being oh, yeah. the business Zero that rate, you're in. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, I mean, and you're looking at when you add, and that'll be once we add all the state taxes into it that sure. are coming online. But even then, it's, you know, looking at this person who's starting from the beginning, they can't, I, I can't look at him and say, you have, you, this is how you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Again, we come to the farmer and say, okay, what is it you want? How do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. All right, well, these are our options. This is how we can get to that point. Yeah. But we may not be able to do it right away. And if a farmer looks at me, well, it's not, I want to do it that right away. It's like, well, do you have, then you maybe need to scale back your, you know, the size of what you want to do. <laughs> what earlier today gave you, you said something about you would uh, discourage uh, or uh, I forget exactly the words you use, you would probably discourage someone with zero experience from entering into uh, the cannabis cultivation <laughs> world. No, I don't think I said that. No, yeah, you did. You said think, you would discourage anyone with zero experience from going into cannabis cultivation. Well, I mean, I think I think it's pe people think it's easy and uh, yeah. you're it doesn't grow. It's yeah, it doesn't grow on trees. Even it does not grow on trees. There, there are plenty of yeah. there are plenty of people. Who come. <laughs> we could get into, that's a there, whole hour. Right, there, 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 there are plenty of people who have come through my doors who have had zero cultivation. In fact, I've I, I've taken a personal, you know fledgling group of people who are just starting to cultivate yeah. under my wing, yeah. you know, training them how to take proper cuttings and get into the industry. You know, right. if you start small and then have aspirations to get big, I encourage that. I encourage growth on any level. It's, you know, personal or professional, right. but, it, you know, reality dictates where you will be in this market, how you bear. This community is very, very, viciously loyal to itself mm -hmm. yeah you know we all look out for each other and when new people come in we're all very highly suspect about them sure. you know it took a long time before anybody would even say hi to me in Safeway mm -hmm. almost a year and a half and you know my brother-in-law told me right off the bat he's like don't take it personal Gabe yeah. It's like because of where you work, people will not acknowledge you. I have the opposite problem. Too many people say yeah. I am well, this, is, this was back in the days. This is before you yeah. were even open. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. so being a, a, a reference point for those those type of farmers, yeah. um, I say enter cautiously. Yeah. You know, and enter in wisely. And what figure out what you want to accomplish. Yeah. You know, yeah. what your end market is. Are you trying to launch a brand? Are you trying to go right to extract? Um, you know, and obviously there's variables in your techniques and how you go about that, but really having a plan before you jump in and think that there's all this money to be made. Yeah, you know, and it, Well, speaking to your original question, when you were yes. talking about like what he's, he was speaking to a specific type, that was on our, on our phone conversation before yes. this. Um, he was speaking to a specific type of growing. Yes. And that was something that's it's a very, very um, technical type of growing, which would be an NFT system, nutrient, no. film, te yeah. nutrient film technique. Oh, and it's I like, see. yeah, you yeah. don't want to go to a beginning no. grower and no. give them the most advanced method of growing and say, okay, okay have fun with this. Okay. You know, well, <laughs> there's a couple things I want to explore in the few minutes we've got left. I mean, one is just a comment about creating this market for organic and high craft cannabis and high craft medicines is going to be, uh, it's going to be a long, steep climb. I think that's... Uh, but part of the problem is coming back to what we started talking about in the beginning of the of the hour. People being in their isolated, old school, traditional ways up in the hills of getting away from it all, and and now they're all of a sudden thrust into. It's not just a question of being civically involved with local politics. It's a question of, of business skills, knowing how to read a PNL and knowing how to make a business forecast, knowing how to. You know, a lot of people don't have that. They keep their receipts in a shoebox. You know, so what when we have a uh, a green Rush, and you guys have been to trade shows, and you go to Las Vegas to some of these big shows, and 80% of it is ancillary services. You know, we'll give you the best security system and insurances and, and liability and blah, 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 you know, all this other fluff surrounding. There's very little hands-on, really, in, in those trade shows. But then you have stuff like these slick magazines that are coming out, and our poor folks, our community, gets blown away by, wow, this is so cool, I've got to have this. And then they don't know how to think critically about all the stuff. It's the bling factor. Mm -hmm. It's the bling factor. You've got companies that are just full of bling, you know, attention organic growers, mother nature, into your grow room with advanced nutrients. I mean, how do our standard everyday growers here in Man in the Emerald Triangle, how do they take that and, and critically look at that? I think there's a different level of grower here that 
that they can kind of see past the fluff. They've been through that store and yeah. walked past those shelves, and they, you know, the thing is, is a lot of these recipes that are tried and true have been handed down mm. from grower to grower to grower. We all started with somebody's recipe. So it was like, well, here, try this, man. This works really well. And you're like, oh, sweet. You yeah. go off it for a while, and you're like, well, this is just a double of this, and this is just a double of this, and this has, you know, basically all these things that I'm already using. So if I just take out this, and you start to critically think about your garden, you know, and yeah. uh, I think, you know. So you think people are smart enough. Well, That's the uh, essence of what you're saying. <laughs> and marketing is a very powerful tool. <laughs> it's really powerful. It it's true. I mean, it's and, true. And we're trained, we're, we all we're try trained from the time we're yes. kids, you know, I mean, with cartoons, and and that's the other side of it, too. You, like these cartoons that are on here. This marketing is not going to be allowed in, in 2018. Well, I mean, that's for nutrients. So, I mean, they, they can, there's loophole. They're going to be able yeah. to do that for I mean, years. but you see it on going down. Yeah. I, I mean, you see the bud the candy. It's the little giant, kid with yeah. the, thing, the giant <laughs> the marijuana. The roadside you signs, that. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's what you... You know, being dazzled by all that is like you really have to look, like, start doing your own research. Look into these products. Like, what are they? How are they made? Can I source this from you know somewhere else? Can I make my own tea? Um, you know, it's it's like one of we're I'm fo we're focused on vegan organic farming. You know, mm -hmm. and there's vegan organic nutrient lines out there, but I don't need to use those vegan organic nutrient lines to be able to grow true veganics. You know, I, I can do I can grow true veganics by creating my own soil, by making fer fermented plant extracts, by compost teas, uh, top dressing, and my input costs are going to be you know drastically much lower. And but this is this is good. So yeah, we haven't really given you much chance to talk about your veganics <laughs> veganics approach. Go ahead, give give the spiel because as a lot of people believe um, that that it's going to be much more labor intensive and it's actually more it's, difficult it's to do. Non bot like. True veganics it's been it's not a new thing. It's been around for hundreds of years. It's pretty much growing plants with plants, mm -hmm. you know, and rec replicating what happens naturally in nature. You know, if you look in the forest, you don't see rotting animal carcasses everywhere. You know, an animal may die and decompose, but mo you mostly see leaf litter and insects decomposing and um, grasses and um, you know this and a, a, a mycelium network that's under that's connecting and bringing nutrients and water through all the redwood trees. It's like, that's what you see in nature. And so with veganics is like, what we've been working on is how can we replicate that in the, in the, in our garden? You mm. know, how can we create soils that are full of life that are, you know, not, are full of life, but don't also don't use animal byproducts. So no, no blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, no fish. Um, you know, where, what, what, how can we, create, you know, you utilize, you know, things like alfalfa, kelp, um, compost uh, from you know, green manures, um, cover cropping, and beneficial bacteria. And that's not more difficult to get a hold of those materials? It's actually easier, you know, where like alfalfa, for example, I can buy a 40 pound bag, 50 pound bag for 20 bucks, you mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's high in nitrogen, has all types of tr trace elements, has um, tricatinol in it, which, you know, which you, you, buy, you buy, pay a fortune in, in a bottled product, you know, kelp. You know, it's it, making your own, you know, kelp alfalfa teas, like instead of going and buying a liquid extract, mm. you know, where you're paying for a premium, you're paying for the manufacturing costs, you're paying for man, uh, transportation. And not only is your is it more expensive, but it's not obviously not as environmentally friendly. And this is doable on a large scale, but you obviously I'm doing, doing I mean, a I, lot of cultivation. I, we're we're sites, operating yeah. 20,000 square feet of vegan organic production mm. in greenhouse. Huh. And that's utilizing, we, two years ago, I made 400 yards of soil from scratch. There was no vegan, or vegan, veganic soil blend out there. So I, I blended my own soil, they sourced all the inputs. Hmm. And, you know, now I'm, I, we're, we're in a no-till method where we're just top dressing, we're, we're doing uh, amendments every run, cover cropping, you know, weekly teas. Wow. And I mean, I can, can show you some of the product. I mean, it rival you know, our light depth looks like indoor. And I think with Devin's approach, you know, there's going to be more tendency towards the hybridization yeah. of it at first. Yeah. You know, where they're using some salt inputs mm -hmm. for or even just products. organic liquid nutrients. Where if right. you have a deficiency, you may need a little boost, but you're not relying on that. Right, and that's yeah. the thing. You know, it's like the 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 problems. Some of the problems arise. I mean, really, the fertilization and the feeding techniques. Those are all super, you know, easy to kind of tackle as we move forward. You know, with cover cropping, we've seen it with some of our our farms. You know, we've seen some as close to um, 
biodynamic methodologies being used and produce incredible mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough about veganics to, to truly it's, like... It's, it's really, you're right. feeding the soil, not the plant. Right. And, I've, you know, you know, and, and that's where, if you look at the, start looking at the science of it, you know, during photosynthesis, the plant uses close to 40% of its energy into, and puts it back into root exudates. Mm -hmm. So the root exudates create um, enzymes, sugars, polysaccharides, carbon for various microorganisms in the right. soil that then help break down organic matter and provide nutrients and make it bioavailable to the this plant. This I understand, because this is what I teach with my medicine. You right. want to not use any medicines made from, cro from dirt. This has had previous crops because they've used chemical nutrients and pesticides, and it's in that dirt. The soil's dead. Yeah. There's no life in that soil. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. you want it to be teeming with microbes. You want yeah, you want yeah. beetles. You want earthworms. Right. You know, you you want beneficial nematodes. You know, and that creates its natural ecosystem in the soil and what you see in nature. Oh, and nature is yeah. you, <laughs> nature has is pretty dialed in. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, it's only it's when cool. we start getting into um, uncommon pests yes. that, that we really see people. You know, struggle with this type of, sure. you know, ecological. Like we're trying to create a, a biosphere. I mean, Elaine Ingham is probably one of my most favorite people to read. I mean, who's she, this? Elaine Ingham is like she's basically the the she founded compost tea. Foremost like, leading organic right. expert. Yeah, she I mean, put compost you, tea out there to the public. Yeah. If you like compost tea, it's like we all like <laughs> bow down. Yeah. 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 And I love the you know the idea of a soil web and the ability for it to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. But we see pests arise that that aren't common to the area. Mm. Um, start to pop up here and there. You know, um, right now I'm sure everybody who's watching has heard of the root aphid mm. or the uh, the russet the mite. russet mite. Root right. aphids, a lot of root aphids are are because of crappy soil you know that where these these soil i'm not even going to name the brands right. but they're pretty much putting their soil piles and mixing their soil right next to municipal compost facilities where they're all types of pests are being introduced and they can't produce enough of this soil so it's not cooking it's not heating it's not destroying these pests and they're ending up in bag soil mm. and you know russet mites a whole nother you know issue that yeah you know yeah the soil plant health can help resist it but yeah that's that's a whole nother controversial issue, but it is a, that we can even, if you want to get into that pest management part too, that's a whole nother topic. Right. Yeah. Well, let's have another show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pest management's a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother show. We're oh. going to have to have you all back and do this some more, but um, this is great. Let's, let's end the show with, by answering the, the silly magazine, Mar oh. no, I'm so sorry, Marijuana Business Magazine's Great Cultivation Debate. Answer this age-old question. Is it better to grow cannabis in greenhouses, outdoors, or indoors? Garrett, what do you say? <laughs> um, I don't necessarily <laughs> have an opinion one way or the other which way is better. I mean, yeah. you're going to have people that are just like, oh, it needs to be sun-grown, and, and it's, you know, the environmental impact of, of growing indoors or even in a greenhouse, you know, is... is doesn't it, it, it's not environmentally friendly what you're gonna have people arguing I mean there was people that were arguing when when the ordinance was passed here in, in Mendocino County uh -huh. only sun grown they only wanted sun grown and that's it no indoor no no greenhouse no nothing right. um, again it comes down to you know when we talk about drift when we talk about all these different things I mean indoor indoor you're creating a sealed environment mm -hmm. okay uh, it's basically you're trying to mimic nature in a but in a, in a microcosm, in a sealed environment, controlling every amount of the inputs. Mm. Um, greenhouse is kind of a combination of the two. I mean, and then obviously outdoor, you know, it's it, sun grown. Man, it, that's just a debate that I don't <laughs> necessarily have an opinion one way or the other that anyone mm. is, but each one has its benefits. Yeah. I mean, there's no getting around it when you look at uh, potency. Okay, yeah. resin that plants produce, that's their sunscreen. That's, you know, and, and you're not going to get a higher UV index than sun, sun grown. Yeah. You know, even in, when you can't you grow, replicate that with the grow, yeah. in a grow light. It, 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 <laughs> even in a green, I mean, even a greenhouse, it, 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 yeah, you, you just don't have the intensity mm -hmm. or the UV band. I mean, if you were, if you put UV lights in your grow room, you would be walking around with skin cancer so fast, <laughs> it would, you know, so yeah, it's, I mean, there's that aspect of it. And then you look at a greenhouse is kind of like a combination of the two. You know, mm -hmm. taking indoor and outdoor mm -hmm. and mixing it into one in one area. And I mean, you've got a problem right now down in, in Santa Barbara County where there's a, literally a, this, the city is so oblivious to 
what's going on. They're airing their, they're having to air their schools out every morning because the greenhouses are opening up their uh, roofs every night. And what's well, happening? And the smell. Well, Santa Barbara is a, a complete uh, mess this is right car. now. Yeah. <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about Santa Barbara. Sorry, Santa, Santa Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, not, I'm not bashing on carp. I think it's a beautiful place, but it, it, yeah, it's I mean, not under control. There. <laughs> no, there's, it's it's out of control, and and oh dear. And when you see, so it's it's kind of like I mean, there you go. Oh, green, no, no greenhouse, you know. Oh wow. But yeah. again, it's it's just each each one has its benefits. Mm-hmm. I think it also depends on the grower. Um, I mean, when you look at the market. Okay, the market wants indoor. I mean, you look at how, I mean, what the price you can get depending on that product. And then debt versus what, I mean, debt versus greenhouse or full term or whatever. I mean, there's so many different terms to describe it that it comes down to the market, what the market will bear. And the market loves its indoor. Yep. And then you look at greenhouse debt, if you, I mean, which is different. Reality people call it. I mean, they're, right now people are saying, oh, if it's growing in a greenhouse, it's that, which isn't necessarily the case. That's not true, yeah. yeah you but know? which tail wags which dog? Exactly. I mean, does the market yeah. drive what the cultivators do, or can we shape the market? Um, yeah. well, as let's a go cultivator, no. Let's go this way. As a cultivator, yeah. no. You, you don't get to shape the market that way because it's the end consumer and the people who are buying your product as the cultivator, which is the dispensaries for the most part, which unfortunately is your area. But when you go to okay. the harbor side, the largest dispensary in the world, mm-hmm. okay, they buy more cannabis legally than anybody, and some more cannabis legally than anybody else in the country mm-hmm. and they will own I mean they're going to give you a premium price for indoor they're going to give you a price four to five hundred dollars less for your light depth if it's true light depth and then anything below that again sun grown, yeah. sun grown I mean you look on their website sun grown 180 bucks an ounce yeah no I, I, I'm familiar yeah. <laughs> I'm familiar yeah. uh, any other opinions about What's best? Or? Well, I mean, it, it just really depends on your, your your climate, your you know your skills as a grower, um, your your uh, your ability, how, how much you want your startup costs. You know, a greenhouse is not a uh, small investment, nor is indoor. Um, you know, for for uh, for uh, like my group personally, greenhouse. I, you know, I find that it's like Gara saying, it's a it's an amazing hybrid approach. You can't replicate the power of the sun, and if you have the right environmental controls and uh, UVB filter filter in terms of your plastic, you can you know rival the some of the best indoor mm-hmm. and get that bling. And you know, as it's it's come to known as Grindor. You know, it's <laughs> Grindor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hadn't heard that before. Grindor. Yeah, that's interesting. But it, yeah. but greenhouse, you know, and that's where you're seeing, you know, indoor is not necessarily the most economically viable option. What made mm-hmm. what major uh, agricultural commodity is grown on in indoor warehouses. You know, you're starting to see it in certain areas now with vertical farming, but that's why your greenhouse is becoming a very popular method in Colorado and Washington and California is because you do have that hybrid, hybrid approach, and, approach and you can produce, you can save about 70 to 80% versus indoor, but still potentially get that same look if you're, if you're all dialed in. Yeah, and that's yeah. like that's a huge savings. Yeah, no kidding. Wow, that's big. Gabe, final thoughts? I think the market dictates what's best. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard. It's Maybe hard not to say what's that. I mean, best, but what's demanded? You mean? Right. I mean, yeah. in that you know, yeah. I mean, really, what you know, when you say what's best, it's what everybody wants, right? I mean, right, isn't that I isn't that what's best? Well, that, well I mean, if it everybody wants, how you no, define it, I mean, as, as, yeah, but, as a connoisseur, yeah. you know what what we determine is best. I mean, I'd want something super clean. That I knew where it came from, how it was grown, and then tested beyond, you know, clean. Yeah. That's best for me, you know. But when we look at the market and what the market wants, they want a pretty bag with, you know, a lot of funk oh, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily water. clean, right? You know, mm-hmm. and and that's where like if they're, you know, say eighty percent of the outdoors going to extract, there may be that fifteen to twenty percent that is on that superior quality that will end up on shelves and. Mm. But that's what's going to dictate, you know, with the consumer and what the evolution of what the consumer is demanding. You know, that opens up a whole other thing I'd love yeah, to talk about sometime. Right. Is and for me, you know, I mean, coming from Southern California mm-hmm. uh, originally, and the time that I came up here, you could draw a line right across the state, and the two would never know each other. Yeah. You know, the cannabis culture here versus there was so clearly black and white, where here it was very gray and very like understood, like, you know, you didn't need to say anything. Everybody knew, you know, and now you see this kind of dissolving away, 
you know, it's kind of the cool thing to know about cannabis and know about, I mean, in, even just in the, the idea of changing our vernacular towards the way we approach things, you know, call it weed, don't call it yeah, pot. Marijuana, weed versus you know, cannabis. You know, it's, it's like, like yeah. the stigmas you know, and... You know, there's 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 this understanding that we're we're dematerializing this this cover and haze of what this industry is, and I, I look forward to the future. You know, there's a lot of people who are dreading it. Not me, man. I mean, I I, I see, you know, people like Devin and some of the farms that we work with pushing this industry in the right direction. You, you know, I mean, we have the the fortune and the opportunity that people are actually relying on us as experts now. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past we were criminals. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful great? thing. It's a beautiful thing. Right? So, yeah. I mean, to, to sit here and be disparaging about any one thing about this, no way. No way. Not, no. A, not even a, not, it gives me chills to think about I get to work with some of the coolest people mm -hmm. in this industry every day. Yeah. And everybody I, will, I run into and have the opportunity to discuss like these topics. Yeah. You know, I look a, across the table and I see a brother yeah. and a sister. And somebody who battled through this with us. And that gives me all the hope in the world that we win this war. Because we are soldiers and we are the people who have fought the good fight for a long period of time. And we're going to get there. Mm. You know, how we get there, you know, there's a lot of this compromise idea. And, you know, let's make no bones about it. You know, the reason that this economic boom is happening here is because California said mm -hmm. $6 billion in five years. They wrote the check for every investor across the United States to come in and start spending money, mm. you know, to get that type of tax revenue. There's a lot of money that needs to be produced. This is the this is the most yeah. one of the most extraordinary plants on this planet. I mean, everything you need to sustain life can be achieved from this plant. Whether yeah, it's it food, fuel, fiber, medicine, right. connectivity, like it brings all all of us together. You know, right. it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, brown, purple, gay, straight, young, old, rich, or poor. It brings everybody together and that's a powerful thing and yeah, it's such so, like you know as Gabe was saying it's an honor to be able to work with everybody and to be able to work with this amazing plan on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis and excited for the future Great have sentiment. open discussion I mean that's the biggest thing open discussion about absolutely it. yeah no totally well that's that gives me chills both of them. <laughs> <laughs> as well. uh, this has been really a delight a really wonderful conversation yeah, thank you all great. so very very much and that's all for this week on cannabis news and views um, to watch archived programs, go to MendocinoTV.com. And to hear more about all things cannabis, uh, tune in tomorrow morning for the Cannabis Hour at 9 a.m. when host Jane Futcher on KZYX will feature cannabis attorney Omar Figueroa, who's going to be talking about state cannabis regulations. To provide feedback and ideas for this show, Contact me by email through news-views at dragonflywellness.org. See you next time on Cannabis News and Views. Thanks for watching. Cool. That was fun. That was fun. That was cool.